Hello, and welcome to Windows in Time, Rogue River Preserve, Deep Roots in Jackson County History, presented by Jackson County Library Services and the Southern Oregon Historical Society. I am Leah Pascizo, Digital Services Specialist. This program is being recorded once again, so please mute your microphone and turn off your camera to ensure quality recording. There will be a time to answer your questions at the end of the program. Jackson County Library Services acknowledges that its libraries are located within the traditional lands of the Shasta, Tekelma, and Ngatgawa people, whose descendants are now identified as members of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians and Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, as well as of the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians and Modoc Nation, who were forced to relocate to Oklahoma. The result of forced relocation and genocide is that Jackson County is no longer a population center for these specific tribal groups. As of the 2020 census, 4.6% of the population of Jackson County has some indigenous heritage. While this is more than twice the national average, it is a precipitous reduction from the pre-colonial 100%. We acknowledge that indigenous groups are too often relegated to the historical past when, in truth, Indigenous people are essential members of the Jackson County community. We take this moment to recognize the Indigenous peoples whose traditional homelands and hunting ground are where residents of Jackson County live today. And we encourage you to learn about the land you reside on and to join us in advocating for the inherent sovereignty of Indigenous people. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. And our presenter is Pat Atkins. Go ahead. Okay, but this is not Pat. This is Alice Mulally. I'm with the Southern Oregon Historical Society, and I'd like to welcome you because Library Services and the Historical Society co-sponsor these Windows in Time programs. A uh, couple of things coming up at the Historical Society. Uh, every Thursday evening between four and eight, Hanley Farm is open. People come and picnic. They uh, take house tours. This particular week, the first week of the month is um, barn tours of our 1854 barn. And so that's a wonderful experience to come out and just enjoy the farm and maybe have a picnic. The other thing is that the research library at 106 North Central here in Medford is open from noon to four, Tuesday through Saturday every week. Air conditioning works. So it's a great place to come do a little research, see some pictures and enjoy an afternoon there. But it's our great pleasure today to introduce Pat Acklin. Uh, Pat is a, a professor emerita at Southern Oregon University in geography and, eth and environmental studies. Did I do that right? Correct. Okay. And I've known Pat for quite a long time because she used to do something called the Square Mile Project, where students were, her students would pick a square mile and they would have to learn everything about that, what was in that square mile from its uh, Ge geological history and its ethnic history, all aspects of it clear up until today. It was a wonderful project and the students learned so much and they often came into the Southern Oregon Historical Society to get information. So that's how I met Pat, but she has had this interest in the, in the Rogue River Preserve uh, because she's been part of the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy program for many years and has been an officer and committee member on that. So I will turn it over now to Pat Acklin. Um, so our topic today is the Rogue River Preserve. And we're going to find that it is not only uh, something that environmentalists are trying to preserve, but that it has actually quite a little bit of history that's relevant to Jackson County. Um, I've, uh, at the close of the presentation, is a list of work cited and consulted, but particular people needed to be uh, thanked for their contributions to the presentation and uh, to the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy. And uh, they are uh, 
Uh, there uh, in front of you, the familiar Jeff LaLand and George Kramer, uh, whose work we see frequently talking about uh, Southern Oregon archaeology and history. And uh, Kirsty Mergenthaler, the stewardship director at the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy, is the principal author of the management plan for the Rogue River Preserve, and I drew heavily upon her work too. And I wanted to thank uh, Judy Hannah Boyd, and you'll see how she fits into this presentation for uh, her contribution of a historic photo. And of course, the Southern Oregon Historical Society, who, where I found a wealth of information about um, our topic today. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy. If this group had not purchased the Rogue River Preserve, um, I wouldn't be here making this presentation today. So I wanted to start with them and their work in Southern Oregon over the last 44 years. Uh, we are the oldest land trust in the state of Oregon. A land tr trust is a nonprofit organization. Um, our land trust focuses on ha having both easements and owning lands, primarily to preserve natural areas and waterways, but also a fringe benefit is open space. And we are also, uh, we embrace historic farms and forest, uh, managed forests in the area so that we're not simply a preservationist organization. Uh, most of what the Conservancy does Oh, and by the way, let's not confuse the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy with the much, much larger Nature Conservancy. We work together, but we are not the same thing. We both use easements and ownership as a way to preserve land. Uh, conservation easements are legal agreements where landowners give up some of their property rights, um, in this case, their property rights to perhaps develop or log or uh, use a property in a particular way. So these are legal agreements negotiated with owners um, and they aren't always free and neither do they always come with a tax deduction. These often are gifts of love by the individual property owner. So the Land Conservancy protects 12,458 acres in Southern Oregon. Much of it is concentrated in Josephine and Jackson County, as we'll see, but there are uh, some near the coast and some in Eastern Oregon, 72 easements altogether, many property owners, some uh, a, an easement or two are owned by groups of property owners, um, there is an individual who lives here in Southern Oregon who has close to a half a dozen on various properties, agricultural, forest, and otherwise. Uh, before the Conservancy owned the Rogue River Preserve, we owned only one property as a fee-owned property of the five that we currently own. Uh, four of these were donated properties, and we'll take a look at them in a second. And then there's the Rogue River Preserve, uh, for which there was fundraising. So the oldest owned piece of property is the Williams Creek Preserve that is along a, a land locked by private ownership section of Williams Creek that was given uh, to the Land Conservancy by uh, the uh, Williams uh, watershed protection group. And we monitor that for uh, to enhance fisheries uh, because this is a fish an important fish bearing stream. More recently, the Land Conservancy was gifted the uh, Harry and Maryland Fisher Preserve at Pompadour Bluff out to the southeast of Ashland, um, an outstanding property with a with a significant history that Alice helped me work on in the library. 
Um, and most recent of our owned properties are the Whetstone Savannah Preserve and the Agate Desert Preserve, both of which uh, we received from the Nature Conservancy. Um, th that larger group is refocusing their attention on properties that are and lands that um, have an effect on climate change. And since we have a close relationship and an and interest in conservation and preservation, it was a natural fit for us to take over these properties to manage them. And at the Agate Desert Preserve, you see uh, stewardship director Christy Mergenthaler and our two land stewards, Rebecca and Olympia. Uh, we were out there um, counting Lomatium cookii, an endanger, a threatened and endangered plant that we find locally in the Agate Desert. So the Rogue River Preserve um, came to the Land Conservancy's attention in 2009 when the family of Alicia MacArthur, the daughter of Robert Rule, um, approached the Conservancy to talk about negotiating some kind of an arrangement by which that, that property could be conserved. And uh, we worked with the family, uh, our, our um, executive director, Diane Garcia, and the staff, uh, and no negotiated a conservation plan for purchase and uh, to also create a stewardship fund so that there would be some funds to take care of the property in the future. So during that time, the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy Board developed a significant protocol so that we would have guidance about what was good for the organization and the region when we uh, anticipated a sale like this. And ultimately, this property was purchased on June 27, 2017. And you see uh, Maria MacArthur, Alicia's daughter, and myself signing the final papers. It was my privilege to be the board president at the time. So I got to do the fun stuff. How, this would not have been possible without a significant grant from the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, your lottery-funded watershed enhancement program, and uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Because it is on the rogue and the significance of the fisheries is well known, uh, that they were willing partners. And there was also a contribution from the Doris Duke Foundation, which is affiliated with the Nature Conservancy. And then, of course, there were contributions from people and businesses and perhaps some of you who are watching today. Um, altogether, well over $3 million was raised to purchase this property and fund future conservation. And it fit nicely in the conservation plan that existed at the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy. Uh, this is a complicated map. The red dots are the conservation easements that are uh, managed by the Land Conservancy. And the red stars are the fee-owned properties. And in the margin is a listing of the six different focus areas that uh, exist where we concentrate our efforts because of particular qualities in the landscape at those locations. And this uh, map is available on the Land Conservancy's website if you'd like to delve into some of the uh, protected features of the different conservation areas. Um, but the Rogue River Preserve uh, lies in the heart of what is called the Rogue Agate Desert um, Concentration Area. So where is it? What is it? We're about to see. So on this map, we can see a number of conserved properties in the area that is known as the Agate Desert, Sam's Valley, um, north of Medford, northwest of Central Point, west of, uh, or northeast of Central Point, and west of Eagle Point. The green shaded properties are conserved lands. The two table rocks are among them. 
Um, the land, Southern Oregon Land Conservancy easements are in the darker green, and the Rogue River Preserve is red. And as a geography professor, I approve. You want the subject of greatest interest in your color scheme to be that red because it attracts your eye. Okay, I digress. Got to have a little fun here. So this shows uh, the accessibility of the property from Highway 62 and Highway 234 and gives you a general orientation about where it is. So this is a picture of oh, probably the southern two-thirds of the property uh, looking towards Medford and um, just as today we have some smoke and haze. So was the haze present on the day this photograph was taken. It does a good job of focusing on the high points of the Rogue River Preserve, which is 352 acres, uh, because of the island that is present in the river there and is part of the property. There are two miles of stream bank and lots of different habitats we'll explore in a minute and at least 32 rare declining and uncommon plant and animal species. And so you can see just from that listing why um, an, a, an organization interested in conservation of uh, natural areas would be interested. So altogether, there are 40 acres of what is called floodplain gallery forest. And in my mind's eye, when I designed this presentation, I was up there pointing out the various habitats to you, um, but it's kind of hard to point at a computer screen in a Zoom meeting, so, oh well. Uh, so 40 acres of important forest, which you see down in the bottom right-hand corner. There are 40 acres of vernal pools and mounded prairie. And those are the um, mottled looking shades of yellow and gold on the left hand edge of the property. And of course, these are the vernal pools that on occasion harbor fairy shrimp and a couple of those endangered plant species. There are 88 acres of oak woodland, some fantastic oak trees. We'll get a, uh, a closer view of where those are on the property. And um, again, 25 acres of chaparral, some in the mounded prairie areas and the others distinct, and 60 acres of open meadowlands. We've talked about the amount of river uh, front that there is on the stream banks and on the island. And I guess it's not too early to make the point, which I will make again later, that this is an active hydrologically connected floodplain with sloughs, wetlands, streams, springs, and what I would call overflow channels uh, that do a great job of, of uh, slowing floods and absorbing the energy of floods. Uh, in addition to the stream bank areas, there are one and a half miles of seasonal streams and 2.3 miles of swales or low areas that catch runoff in a rainstorm. And I understand that there was a, that the thunderstorms of last night, one parked right on top of this area and the Dodge Bridge area. So I bet those swales were flowing some pretty good amounts of water just last evening. So there's significant biodiversity there. 300 species of plants, 100 species of birds, and then of course the rare and at risk species I mentioned before. So for the Land Conservancy, there was this opportunity to not only preserve these important features, but to uh, use the property for education. And so um, we have in-person field trips. It's not an open park. These are special times that are arranged. There are lots of opportunities for kids, both uh, in-person field trips and during the pandemic, um, a number of digital opportunities were developed there. Uh, we already have uh, 
researchers from Southern Oregon University and other places looking into some of the species that are there and investigating the habitats and there are stewardship opportunities. And that's important for our membership who want not just to know these things are preserved, but to actually get their hands dirty, helping with their protection and preservation. And as I said, volunteer opportunities. We have a docent pro program here and uh, others will, are in development. Site stewards, people who are interested in stewardship of a particular aspect of a property. You might have heard of the Loving the Land program where elementary uh, kids are taken out on the Ortson Todd Woods property in Ashland. It's a Ashland City Park but it was uh, donated to the Land Conservancy and then turned over to the city for management. And if you think getting your hands dirty and having a little fun on some property uh, sounds like a good idea to you, we do uh, organize private work parties for uh, work groups and other organizations. It's a real team building thing to pull Scotch group together. Well, anyway, I got a laugh out of someone in the audience. Thank you. So the things that put the board over the edge and actually uh, in deciding to raise this money and to get this property were, of course, that it is on the iconic Road River. The Lower Rogue was part of the original Wild and Scenic Rivers Act in 1968. As a person who taught introduction to physical geography for a couple of decades, it is an exemplary cross-section of a stream valley, and I'm going to share more about that with you in a second. It has unique soils and topography that have resulted in these unique wildlife opportunities. And the fisheries in the Rogue are important um, and have been recognized for decades. So the part about the stream valleys, it's uh, one of the things that's hard to see in a stream valley is the uh, kind of the, the micro features. And in this set of diagrams, in the first block, you see a stream uh, running in a valley. And in the second block, you see it after it's had a chance to provide some sediment as a result of erosion. Uh, and in the third block, what's happened, and this is typical of the road, is there's been some uplift, in our case, from subduction um, off the coast of Oregon, that's lifted the region. And activities like volcanism that have put down uh, lava on the surface. And meanwhile, the rogue has continued to cut its stream bank out of the coast, its stream, its uh, valley out of the Cascades and across the coast range. And so as uplift continued, it creates a series of what are called terraces or places that are uh, once floodplains that are now left high and dry above the river, and that's what you see in the fourth block. So I got really excited when we I first went there because I could see the up high terrace and the low terrace and the floodplain and the channels, and it's rare to be able to see those things. Often they're covered with vegetation, and even more often in the present with houses. So uh, I thought that that would, so that was one of the iconic features. Here you see a soils map that shows the linearity of the soil patterns and the lime green stripe down the middle is probig very gravelly loam, which is, I know doesn't sound very exciting, but it's a deep loamy soil at the edge of the terrace, the high terrace, and it's just covered with oaks. And I'll point those out to you in another slide. So that's an example. Uh, and I also think that, that for a soils map, does a pretty good job of telling you, even if you don't know the Rogue River is there, that something linear is going by. Because look at all those stripes of soil that are even with the flow of the river. 
A number of those soils are typical floodplain soils that we find along the road. And the habitat map shows how uh, the various habitats relate to the soils. And um, of course, it's dominated by that floodplain gallery forest. But you also see the extent of the orange colored oak woodlands. Uh, the vernal pools are shown in white. So three significant habitats that are a bit, that are obvious as we look at this mapping. Uh, and there are several others in between that we'll cover. So the floodplain gallery forest is significant. It's the largest of its size on the upper row. The significant tree species in the forest are the black cottonwood and the ponderosa pine. But there are also Oregon ash, um, vine maple, um, firs, cedars. But the dominant species are the black cottonwood and the ponderosa pines, and they are significant. There are terraces on the terraces, there are meadows, and you can see along the edge of this meadow picture on the right hand edge, the oak woodland that extends along that particular soil unit I pointed out to you. And the dominant oak species is the Oregon white oak that's there. The, there are grass species. Some of them are um, non-natives that have been planted for hay and pasture over time. But uh, there is a presence of Romer's fescue and other uh, native grasses. So there can be some rehabilitation of these meadows. There's the chaparral uh, and vernal pools. And here you see uh, a, a vernal pool area carpeted with a host of spring wildflowers. Um, and there would be where we would find the large flowered woolly meadow foam. And then not everyone's favorite, but buckbrush, which is um, typical of that landscape and provides um, sustenance for this marvelous herd of elk that trades across the property on occasion. And this photo was taken by Tom Craig, our um, caretaker of the property. And I have to say, it's my very favorite picture of the Rogue River Preserve, the elk crossing the river. And the first time I visited, I could not believe how heavily the elk had grazed the buckrush. I mean, they were hammered, if, if you, for lack of a better term. <laughs> so a significant source of browse. And if just a few of the other species um, the pileated woodpecker, those are the big woolly pecker, woodpeckers after uh, which Woody the woodpecker was designed, um, present on the property. The oak titmouse, a diminutive little bird, but with a cute little crest on the top. And I'm happy to say that they frequent my black sunflower bird feeder. And the Lewis's woodpecker. This is a uh, species that is, not, is uncommon, but uses the preserve heavily because of the presence of the oaks. I don't believe that the bird folks have seen the nesting, but we've seen them in abundance in the spring when we visit the property. And then in the bottom row, the two species of salmon that are of interest, and you know, the fish are the thing that of all the endangered species, the fish have had the greatest amount of federal funding spent on them. And so that it makes it understandable why the US Fish and Wildlife Service would have made a grant to protect uh, this property. They have been seen to uh, spawn in the gravels there. Um, and other activities that are important to fisheries biologists. And then in the middle of the bottom, the Northwestern pond turtle, which uh, is the native turtle. 
and they are in great decline. Their biggest enemy, as I understand it, are the imported bullfrogs that were brought into the region by folks who were hungry for frog legs. So if you like frog legs, go get some bullfrogs and do something good for the Northwestern pond turtles. Never try them, they all say, tastes like chicken. And then there are the rare and uh, flora. And I found it interesting when I was putting this together and looking at the uh, white fairy poppy, which is uh, very rare, the white flowered Navaricia, the large flower woolly medfoam, and then cute little Austin's popcorn flower. And there are six kinds of popcorn flowers there, but the Austin's is the important one. Uh, they were all white. And I thought, isn't that interesting? These diminutive little white flowers are rare. And so to spice up the slide, I put the common buttercup and of course the great camas, which um, used to be far more abundant in uh, our area and which was one of the important Native American foods. So there are lots more, but these are exemplary of what can be found there. And again, when you see all this together, you get a sense of why a group that wants to conserve and preserve nature would find this property of great interest. So now the part where we get to talk a little bit more about the people and the history of what occurred on this landscape. Geographers call the various people who live in a place, which often changes over time, the sequent occupants. And Leah, our um, library technological person, did a fine job of introducing the relevance of the Native American people um, to, the, to our local area. And so in um, learning how to best manage the property, one of the first things people do is look into the indigenous history of the property. And so the Land Conservancy invited our member and volunteer, Jeff Leland, who's done a great deal of this work um, for the National Forest and for others in his career to conduct a survey of what might have been at the property. And so he found two sites uh, where there was evidence of uh, probably the Tequilma group of Native Americans using this property for seasonally, no permanent settlement evidence, but he did find uh, in the two sites some uh, larger flaked stone tools in the lithic scatter and residue or what is called the lithic debitage from making small uh, flaked stone tools. So early on in one of my visits to the property, I picked up a couple of obsidian um, flakes that were lying on the ground in the path. And, that's what you see there in the slide. So the, the, the evidence in the sites is abundant, and um, but there isn't anything that needs to be, uh, well, care needs to be taken, but there were no significant sites or villages. Probably a seasonal camp. You've seen the oaks, there were acorns, the camas bulbs, grasshoppers, which, you know, we might be adding to our diet soon, I understand. I may not quite be there yet. And tarweed, I think harvesting tarweed seeds sounds uh, like an interesting pastime. And they would be spicy, I would think. Uh, and then it was, of course, used for hunting deer, elk, and for the access to the fishery. And there were other plants available. Uh, the Klamath plum, which we find throughout the region, hazelnut or filbert, um, service berry, and in the photographs on the slide, ukau in the top right, and 
yampa, which had both a root and a grain product from them. Um, there were firecraft rocks that uh, Jeff found, and he also suspected that fire could have been used to manage the uh, properties to keep the brush down between the oaks and, um, and to renew um, the property or the landscape. So again, Leah did a good job of talking about the kind of competition that there was, or it was between the Native American indigenous people and miners and pioneers during the Caucasian settlement. And um, some of the things that we think about the people vying for territory but as lands were settled by Caucasian settlers, there was a significant impact on food, on root crops, on the game availability, and access to fishing. And so hunger was an additional um, problem that we don't always think about when we think about the conflict in those times. And uh, again, Leah mentioned earlier the removal of the tribes from the Table Rock Reservation that was formed um, in the area south of the preserve uh, in 1853. So after those uh, folks were taken on the Trail of Tears to the reservate to the Silette's Reservation in 1856, there was not as much conflict and uh, the the appearance of threat was uh, removed and people began to settle the area of the Rogue River Preserve. The first survey was done in 1855, but people didn't seem to really settle there into the 1860s and 70s. Um, here in the Bear Creek Valley, the soil was better. The local survey remarked that the prairie soil was first rate. Yet when you moved out to the area of the 1855 survey and the property that we're talking about is fairly centrally located in this survey map of the township and there's a little close of it, up of it there to the right. It was described as rolling oak and pine hills, good grazing land. And in the low flatter areas, it said prairie soil, second rate gravelly. So you can see just from those notations why people might have wanted to settle along in the Bear Creek Valley first because the land was better. And so it took a while for folks to get out there and to begin settlement. Um, and as I said, the lands were claimed in the 1860s and 1870s. The dates we have from the 1870s are the dates that are in the Bureau of Land Management um, records for homesteaded properties, as opposed to those claimed by the donation land claim settlement era, slightly earlier, where the better lands were claimed. So on our property, the southern half of the Rogue River Preserve, really essentially the area where the forest is, was claimed by someone named Thomas Jackson, and the northern half by Jacob Kennedy. And there, there is a location in the northern half along near the intermittent stream where there are two springs called Kennedy Springs. But other than a few relic apple trees, there's nothing left uh, on the landscape from those days. And I find it of interest that the neighbor in the top left-hand corner was a fellow named Josiah Hanna. And so uh, I'm going to approach this area more like I would have had my students do in looking at a square mile because some of the neighbors are interesting. We need to see a little bit more about them. And Hannah certainly was interesting. Um, the notes in the his Jackson County Historical Society publication, Hannah, Pioneer Potters on the Road, say that Josiah arrived in 1862, and his whole story is there. There were some politics around slavery in his background. And he came and he found local clays unsuitable, although uh, locals will know we have a lot of local clay. 
Uh, he did eventually find a, a local clay that was suitable for potting and created Hannah Pottery, which he sold widely around the county. And there is a story in the booklet about Peter Britt buying the wagon loads of pottery to um, store all of those things that he was growing there on his orchards and his vineyards and so forth. And uh, again, I think uh, in the top line, it says they found a severe need for cleanable surfaces, something that you could wash and store things in. So um, his son, Joseph, continued the business after he died. And I found it noteworthy to see that flooding had occurred in the area and it forced them to move their kiln upslope in 1890, which was six years before they went out of business. So, but not only did Hannah Pottery live next door, <laughs> but Josiah, uh, oh, here's Joseph and some of the examples of the Hannah Pottery. Um, I should point out that I could have brought the top center pot with me today, but I didn't want to be responsible for schlepping it into the library. It resides in the living room of Mark Moskowitz in Ashland, where he found it when he bought the home in the early 1970s and uh, still in use in uh, this railroad district home. So it lives on in the same place today. Well, Josiah didn't just start pottery. He also uh, developed um, a ferry that uh, was influential because the transportation was so limited at the time. And this is a photograph of a derelict monument that uh, um, at the site of the Hannah Ferry. So some important um, early neighbors of the Road River Preserve. Um, the next owner of the property was a fellow named Emery Hunt. We don't know very much about him. He owned vast tracts of land. Um, there is at the Historical Society a photo of the Grand Army of the Pro Republic mustering. And it says that Emery Hunt is in the photo but Ben Truey has a suspicion that it's a typo and that it was really Eber Emery, who was an important Ashland pioneer. So that is a mystery we've yet to unravel. Another important landowner was Burdett Dodge, and Dodge's home is preserved on uh, Geneva Street in Medford and is part of the National Historic Register. And he owned uh, uh, about 2,000 acres in this neck of the woods. And on the Metzger map is Burdett Dodge's name over and over again. And there isn't a lot of information about him. Uh, Christy Mergenthaler, the land, stu the stewardship director, looked at this map and she said, why it's Dodgelandia, which I thought was uh, a good name for it. Thousands of acres but very isolated. So Dodge is important in that he and um, another local, Frank Ray, who was an engineer and built uh, Gold Ray Dam, uh, pressed the county commissioners to build Dodge Bridge, which is an important bridge over the modern road. And it has had its trials and tribulations as well, having been repeatedly affected by flooding over time. So, um, so Dodge sells the property to Andrew and Julia Dell Welch from San Francisco. He was the president of the California and Hawaiian Sugar Refining Comfort Company, and they used it as a re summertime resort and probably grazed cattle. Um, she was a socialite, always in the San Francisco newspapers, but at one point, they sell to the rules, and Robert and Mabel Rule um, had a significant impact on Jackson County, not from their home on the Road River Preserve, 
but from because he was the editor and publisher of the Mail Tribune. They too leased the land to cattle ranchers. And here we see Everett Hanna um, in history farming the one of the terraces at the Rogue River Preserve. So Rule is an important county figure. He owned and operated the Medford Mail Tribune, and as Leland says, was Oregon's archetypal crusading small town newspaper man. His battle against the Ku Klux Klan in the 20s earned him the respect of Oregon journalists, and his paper's fight against a radical local populist movement, the Good Government Congress, brought him the Pulitzer Prize in 1934. Um, and he was one of the first mainstream Western journalists to criticize Joseph McCarthy. I'm running a little short of time, so I am not going to read to you this article from the Mail Tribune, where only recently George Kramer made a presentation about one of the principles in the Good Government Congress conflict. Take some time, look up this important historical set of events. They have a strikingly familiar feel to some of the conspiracy concerns that we are experiencing in the present day. Unfortunately, in this circumstance, uh, it resulted in the murder of the local sheriff after whom Prescott Peak is named. And uh, Rule, writing about it, earned the Mail Tribune the Pulitzer Prize. So uh, had I not waxed so long and loftily about the characteristics of the Rogue River Preserve, I would have been able to read you the story. But we're going to have to skip that today. So Rule used the lodge, which was hard to get to. Roads weren't necessarily paved, rivers weren't necessarily present. Um, but once they got out there, they relaxed, they played a lot of cards, I understand. And you can see the shutters on the lodge bear the symbols of the four suits of playing cards. And um, they did fish a lot too, but cards and fishing. And I think that they might have done a little drinking as well. Um, so in 53, Alicia inherits it, but they continue to use this as a family uh, resort. And in this property experience, the 1964 flood, and there is a story that there was a boat-shaped bar and liquor cabinet that washed away in the 64 flood. And the youthful members giggle a lot when you talk. Well, they were youthful at the time, not anymore. Um, anyway, they believed that the kids found the liquor, drank it all, and then said, what? The flood must have washed all those bottles away. Uh, anyway, so that's the best story I have about the rules and the launch. Um, so what's happening now? Well, we have a few loose ends to wrap up. First of all, it's no longer isolated. Here's a map of the uh, tax lots in the area. And you can see in the aerial photo, there are there is housing and agricultural land. There are a number of people living in the neighborhood as opposed to those early days. Um, served by two major highways, essentially, the Phaedrex subdivision, and we see this rural residential land use pattern emerging. And so it is no longer isolated. What's happening with flooding? Well, the Hannahs had to move their kiln, and we saw the impact of flooding on Dodge Bridge over time. And, uh, but now we have Lost Creek Dam, built in 1977, finished in 77 by the Corps of Engineers. And uh, it has reduced the flooding on the road. Um, although in 2015, the, the road did flood, but not, it didn't come up across the, the it did flow underneath the lodge 
it came, was banked full. And you can see in the bottom uh, right-hand corner that there was a thin veneer of flood water flowing over the road access to the lodge by the river. So really, the property is doing exactly what folks like the Watershed Enhancement Board and the USGS uh, um, thought it would do. It allows flood water to spread, reduces velocity, absorbs that energy from the flooding, and the sloughs and overflow channels provide refuge for fish in the flood. So the flooding is different, still will occur, but on a, it looks like a, a much less significant level. You have this property is here to help absorb that energy when it does. We're coming down home stretch. So in the impact report for 2021, the Land Conservancy reports on uh, launching open lands days and initiating the site steward program, completing trails, removed six acres of scotch broom, which is no small feat, pulled 28 acres of noxious yellow star thistle. This is stewardship of a property so that those plants which grew there naturally can continue to grow. There's funding from Pacific Corps for more habitat registration. There were work parties, site steward days, youth learning days, 262 volunteers. Oh, and I like the collection of native plant seeds by the Rogue Native Plant Partnership for other habitat restoration. And the 800 pollinator plants planted by the Understory Initiative. Lots of cool partnerships with other organizations. And finally, the 552 elementary school students who visited for nature journaling and observation. So that is the good work that is proceeding and what the vision for the future is. Thank you.